11.1 begins by saying, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, for by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. So we come to this idea of faith, and we hear a lot about faith today. People will say to you, have faith, you know, encouraging you in a tough time, or they'll say, keep the faith, and you say, okay, and walk away thinking, what does that mean? Uh, we hear much in the, fa- in the church about faith confessions, and uh, blind faith, and uh, blind optimism, but as we look at this definition, these three verses, probably uh, the closest thing in the Bible to a definition of faith, again, it is observed in the lives of many and demonstrated, and uh, there are exhortations in regards to faith, but we kind of have this defining to a degree, at least, of some of the dynamics of faith in these first three verses, and I think it's important for us to understand what a biblical faith is, because this passage begins with the word faith. For or now, and that's connecting it to what has been said. So if you look at chapter 10, verse 35, it says, Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which has great recompense of reward, looking to the future. For ye have need of patience, that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he, that's Jesus, that shall come, will come, and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall no, have no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back unto perdition, to damnation, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. And he begins to define then what this faith is that he's speaking of. He takes the verse from Habakkuk, the just shall live by faith, and and that kind of is summing up his point uh, as he goes now to describe biblical faith. And as we look at the context in Habakkuk, uh, it was an era in his day when he was surrounded in his own nation by immorality, by a lack of commitment to God or an acknowledging of God, by idolatry. Uh, by a nation, uh, by and large, much like America, that had forgotten God, that had turned away from God. And as he looked at all of the injustices, and we see many in our own land around the world, it seemed as though God was doing nothing about it. And Habakkuk's cry and complaint was that very thing. Where are you? What are you doing? And he was shaken uh, in his faith. And he brought his concept around to the point where he realized, he said, the just shall live by faith. And he sums up his prophecy by saying, although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines, the labor of the olive shall fail and the fields shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold. There shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength and he will make my feet like his feet and he will make me to walk upon my high places. Back again by saying, though every circumstance that surrounds me contradicts the love of God and the care of God and the concern of God, yet I've realized that walking by faith is separate from my circumstances, that there will be time when circumstances seem to confirm the love and care of God, and there will be times in all of our lives when our circumstances seem to be telling us that God no longer cares about us or for us. And yet he realizes, though every circumstance in my life seems to deny God's care, and the, and the, the, the vineyard is failing, there's no calves in the stall, there's judgment upon the land, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, the God of my salvation. He will keep me from falling. He's going to make my feet be upon solid ground like hen's feet on high places. And it's that backdrop that, that gives rise to three times in the New Testament the same verse, the just shall live by faith. Once in Romans 1.17, 
and is speaking about salvation there. In Galatians 3.11, the just shall live by faith, talking about our liberty and, and our life in Christ. And in Hebrews, the just shall live by faith, directly related to faith. So it's interesting the way it's laid out in the New Testament. Romans, the just, Galatians shall live, Hebrews by faith. And certainly Hebrews defines this idea of faith. And he says, in light of this kind of truth and uh, enduring, waiting for the promises of God to be realized in our present circumstances, knowing that the just shall live by faith, now, he tells us, that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And we begin to get a biblical view of, of this faith. Now, he tells us that it operates in two realms. The kind of faith that God wants you to have and he wants me to have operates in these two realms. One is the future. It's the substance of things hoped for. So the faith that God wants us to have operates in the realm of the future. And it is the evidence of things not seen. And so it operates in the realm of the invisible or the spiritual or the eternal. That's important to realize because there's so much in the church taught today about positive confession and uh, if you believe this will happen and you'll have a Mercedes in your parking spot and, you know, prosperity and, and it's little to do with biblical faith that believes those circumstances contrast the love of God or seem to contrast the love of God. And it isn't faith in faith, but faith in God who he says here, created and sustained the worlds and sustains the worlds. So he begins by telling us this biblical faith, it operates in the realm of the future and it operates in the realm of the unseen. Now, substance is what he relates to the future. And it's an interesting word, uh, hupotasis in, in stasis in the Greek means Hupo is under stasis to stand. It means that which is standing under us. Your Bible may say confidence, but it's the idea, it's the foundation underneath of us. The plain phrase from the Latin is sub, where we get submarine, subterranean, which means under, and stands in the Latin to stand. And again, it means to stand under. We get substance from the Latin word. And it's, it is what is standing under us or keeping us on solid ground is that which has taken the future and made it a present reality with us. It's almost as through faith, the future, that, that which we are looking forward to has an appendage that reaches to us now in this time space, space world and has affected our lives to the point where it keeps us, our feet on solid ground. It, it is what is standing under us even when life seems to be falling apart. It's faith is the substance of things hoped for. That's important because some people talk about blind faith. Our faith is not blind at all. People talk about security. There is no security in your bonds maturing. That's obvious today. There's no security in you maturing in some ways. Uh, There is no uh, security in, uh, you know, collecting your first million. There's no security. As we see around today, a 7.6 earthquake can change all that in one day. So can a hurricane. So can a doctor's report. So can the sound of brakes screeching coming towards you. How quickly everything that we think is secure can change in an instant like that. But what he's saying is biblical faith, because because what underpins us about biblical faith is connected to the future and, and makes enough of the future a present reality in our lives that we're not shaken when this present life seems to be falling apart because part of what we're standing on has been lent to us by a divine act from something that is still ahead of us and that we're still looking forward to. So in one sense, it's saying faith is our firm ground while we await fulfillment of future promises, and it sustains us in this present interval. That's what we live in, as an interval. This isn't, our, this isn't God's ultimate plan for us. This is a temporary state, and the Bible says this present life is like a dream. You're 10 years old, then you're 70, and it went like that, and you don't know where life went. It passes away like a vapor. God has in his heart the eternal for us. So it says that faith now keeps us, puts us on solid ground while we're waiting for those future things, and, uh, and we receive a portion of them presently because they're, they're underpending us. They're the, that real to us. 
evidence of things unseen. The word evidence means to be tested, to be proved, to be convinced. It's used one other time in that form in 2 Timothy 3.16 where it says the word of God is good for, for correction, for reproof. That's the word. The same idea of reproof. Jesus in 846 of John's gospel says to the Pharisees, which of you convicteth, that's the same word, me of sin. So uh, the, the first part, our faith, in, in God's promises, you know, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And it says what keeps us, John, 1 John 5, 4, in this present world, our victory is even our faith. But there has to be attached to that a subjective experience. And when it says here that the evidence, it's the conviction of things not seen, that, that in our hearts there is a testimony, the spirit of, of sonship in our hearts crying, Abba, Father, there is a testimony within us, as it says, that eye has not seen, ear hath not heard, and neither has it man- entered into the mind of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him, but by God's spirit he has already made those things real to us. When we try to describe those things to our unsafe friends and relatives, they think that we have gone insane. And rightly so, because they don't have the capacity to take hold of those truths. You know, the Bible says, again, taste and see that the Lord is good. That is not speaking with the physical tongue. The Bible says that we should lay hold of the promises of God. That is not the physical hand. The Bible says we behold God in Christ. That is not with the physical eye. And the idea is for for all of us as God's believing children, he has enlivened us spiritually so that we exercise some dynamic now that the Bible calls belief or faith that makes a future reality to us today and it makes the unseen visible to us and Paul said that again that he was renewed day by day while we look not at those things that are seen because the things that are seen are temporary but at the things that are not seen because they are eternal so it says here, first of all, that, that there is a substance to our faith, and that is an underpinning, and it's related to future things. It, it, we, we live for that day. We're looking forward to seeing Christ. We're looking forward to the trumpet blast. We're looking forward to standing in streets of gold. We're looking forward to being reunited with loved ones that have passed on, with children, with brothers and sisters and parents. We're looking forward to no tears, no sorrow, no suffering, no cancer, no divorce. All the things that the Bible tells us about, that has to grow in us as a great reality, and we'll find it becomes so real that it becomes ground underneath of us presently so that when life falls apart, it is not affected. And secondly, it says there is an evidence that goes with it, a conviction of things not seen that helps us remain on that solid ground. That in all of us, you know, that we know that it's real. When we make a mistake, we're going, oh, man, Lord, forgive me. You know, there's a conviction there of the reality of all of these things. An evidence, it says, in us of things not seen. Now, he takes that and he applies it in verse 2 to many of the Old Testament saints. So when it says elders here, it's the fathers. And he's writing to the Hebrews and he's going to make example then of Abel and of Enoch and of Noah and of Abraham. He's going to go through what he's speaking of here as the elders. And, uh, and this is what he says about them in regards to this faith. He says this, for by it, That is, by this faith, the elders obtained a good report. Now, uh, by it is is literally in this, it's locative, it's in the sphere of this faith. It isn't through faith. They didn't do something through faith, because then they would have gotten the glory. The idea is in the sphere, in the realm of this kind of faith, the elders obtained a good report... And the interesting thing about that in the Greek, it's in the passive. It is not active. It it is they were well reported of. It wasn't them. They didn't earn a good report. It says they were well reported of in the sphere of this faith. Now that's important because as we read the 11th chapter of Hebrews, we don't hear about Noah's drunkenness. We don't hear about Abraham's defections. We don't hear about all the character flaws and the problems and the failures in their life because in the sphere of faith, they were well reported of. 
And what that says to us is, is for you and I, our past is no handicap to us to walk with Christ. Whatever we did, whatever sin uh, that hounds us, we should cast it off. It should not be on our conscience uh, because in the realm of faith it is non-existent. That it isn't by our intellectual ability or our charisma or any natural charm. It's by trusting in something that is yet future. It is by having a conviction in our hearts of things that exist now and will exist that are still not seen that we walk forward. And it is by that kind of faith, these elders that we're going to look at over the weeks to come, they maintain this good report. Now the, the thing that's important about that is... They maintained that faith when life was falling apart. Abel exercised that faith and then was murdered by his brother. Noah maintained that faith when he was being mocked for over a hundred years and his whole generation was destroyed. Abraham maintained that faith even as he came to the promised land and faced all kinds of hardship and failure. And the idea is, okay... It's the substance, the underpinning of things that we're hoping for. That's great. We all like that. We're looking forward to heaven. It's the evidence of things that are not seen. We're all willing to agree with that. But it is the ability of those things to continue to function when life is falling apart that makes it this biblical faith that we're looking at here. Now, we all live by faith. You have to understand that. If you've ever ordered off of a menu... You've done that by faith. You know, maybe I'll try this. It sounds good. That's faith. The last time you took an antibiotic, you exercised faith. The last time you got on an airplane, your faith was tried. Believer or non-believer, you stood around the airport and you looked at that crowd that was getting on the plane with you and, I thought, and you thought to yourself, does this look like a group of people God could do without? <laughs> You're laughing, you all know. <laughs> does this look like somebody God's mad at and he wants to get him in a plane crash? Is this that airline that always goes down? You exercise faith in that machine and in that pilot. When you came to church this morning, you exercised faith in your brakes when you put your foot on the pedal. Some of you exercise more faith than others. I understand that. (laughs) But you see, faith is only as valuable as its object. If your brakes fail, that's how good your faith is. Because they were in your brakes. If the plane goes down, your faith is only good, as good as its object, as good as that machine or that pilot. If you get tomain poisoning, food poisoning off the menu, your faith is only good. But the, but the point here is all of them had faith in a living God who loves them so much that he provided a substitute For their forgiveness and eternal life. And that when cancer comes. Or when we're rushing our children to the emergency ward. Or when our marriage seems to be falling apart. Or when depression seems to be driving us to the psychologist. And we don't want to do that as a Christian. Or when the circumstances in our life seem to contradict God's love towards us. This is the kind of faith that continues. Look in verse 35 of chapter 10. Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For you have need of patience that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise for yet a little while. And he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Look in verse 13 of 11. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them. And they embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims 
in the earth. Look in verse 27, speaking of Moses. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured, notice, as seeing him who is invisible, the evidence of things not seen. Look in verse 39. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. The idea is every generation that has ever lived who has believed in God and his promises has lived and died in this physical world without seeing them realized. Oh, there will be a place with no sickness, with no sorrow, where he will wipe away every tear, it says, from our faces, where there is no more death and there is no more curse. That is a real place. And faith is taking part of that and making it real in our hearts this morning, though we've never seen it or touched it. There's an evidence, there's actually a conviction about these things in our lives though they're not seen. And when all else falls apart in life, and it will, you know, I love to see somebody who lives 80 years, doesn't have a doctor or a dentist, and is gone in two weeks. I'll take that. Or be healthy your whole life and Love Jesus and lay down one night and wake up in heaven. Huh, you know, oh, wow, you know. But it, that isn't the way it will happen to all of us. And the faith that the scripture enjoins upon us is not a faith that has to do with prospering right now. It doesn't have to do with the positive confessions and the faith in faith. The Bible enjoins upon us a faith that endures when life contradicts. It gives us a witness of some great future thing that we're all looking forward to that causes us to bear up under the present strain of life. All of that, see, is based on the object of our faith. Hebrews tells us God has spoken in sundry times, in many ways, through the prophets. But in these last of days, our present days, God has spoken once and for all in Son, it says. He has made his final statement to man in Jesus Christ upon the cross through the crucifixion and resurrection of his love of his desire to purchase for all of us an eternal place and beckons us then to come and to receive Christ, to receive forgiveness, to partake of the promise. And those of us who have partaken are then awakened to a reality that is perceived. It says that in verse 3. Through faith we understand. That is the word perceive. It is never used in the Bible, a physical sight. It's talking about perception in our hearts. Through faith we perceive that the worlds, the ages, were framed by the word of God, rhema, by God speaking and calling them into existence, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. You and I are are miles ahead of, of those evolutionists that are desperately struggling to keep alive their religion as scientific discovery year by year continually proves them more and more wrong, that evolution is an impossibility. You and I have faith in that God who loves us. So when circumstances contradict that, the thing that, that keeps us is we know who has made the promise. It isn't our brakes. It's not the airplane. You know, when the airplane starts going down, stand up in the aisle, preach the gospel as fast as you can. <laughs> Get a, more, a few more jewels in your crown the last minute. You know where you're going. You know who paid for your life. You know who holds it in his hand? It says here, if he created and sustains presently the worlds, the ages, then he can certainly create things in us and sustain us. And that's whose hand we placed our life in, in the hands of Almighty God who loves us. So what is the definition? It's something that deals with the future, with the unseen. 
It underpins us and holds us up. How is it exercised? By enduring this present world and not disintegrating under the pressure as we watch unsaved people lose not only their health or their well-being or their family or their finances, but their very lives. We're sustained. Why? Because of who has made the promises. The one who created and formed the ages themselves and sustains them presently and has come in human flesh because he loved us so much to give us life. If you're here this morning and you don't know Christ personally as Lord and Savior, I encourage you after the service to come forward and pray with one of us. We'll have, give you a Bible. We'll talk to you. You need to make that decision. If you know there's more, you know there's more, you know there's more, the light doesn't go on until you ask Christ in your heart. Then that capacity to see beyond the physical comes to life. Those of you that are struggling with sickness, with hardship, with heartache, I encourage you to come forward for prayer too because God has placed something within your heart that will endure. Though, though it seems maybe this morning that it won't, it will endure. And we know that this is an illusion around us today. Again, uh, it, it's interesting that uh, just having Chuck Missler last year, week here talking with him, the, the quantum, the, one of the world's leading quantum physicists committed suicide a little while ago because he couldn't handle what he was discovering. And, and again, they're discovering that an atomic structure... If, if you had a nucleus the size of a basketball, the closest electron would be in California, 3,000 miles away. And they're realizing that everything here is mostly space. <laughs> they're realizing that this looks like a wooden pulpit, but it's an electrical field. It's not at all a wooden pulpit that there's hardly anything to it all, that if they took all the space out of earth, it would shrink down into a basket. And the quantum physicist that committed suicide said it's almost as though everything that exists is a thought in the mind of God. Because the study of atomic structure is proving this is a non-reality. That doesn't help when it hurts. When when this non-reality is ganging up on you, you have to remember the greater reality and realize that God has already breathed into us a down payment of those things that is an anchor to our soul as we await the day that he gathers us home. Let's stand and pray.